Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 41, Motives of Justice. St. Bernardine relates that a married couple, having no children, made a contract that in case one should die before the other, the one who survived was to distribute the property left to the other for the repose of the soul of the deceased. The husband died first, and his widow neglected to fulfill her promise. The mother of the widow was still living, and the deceased appeared to her, begging her to go to her daughter, and urged her in the name of God to fulfill her engagement. If she delays, he said, to distribute the alms, the sum which I have destined for the poor, tell her on the part of God, that in thirty days she'll be struck by a sudden death. When the impious widow heard the solemn warning, she had the audacity to treat it as a dream and persisted in her sacrilegious infidelity to her promise. Thirty days passed, and the unfortunate woman, having gone to an upper room in her house, fell through the window and was killed on the spot. In justice towards the dead, of which we have just spoken, in fraudulent maneuvers to escape the obligation of executing their pious legacies, are grievous sins, crimes which merit eternal punishment of hell, Unless a sincere confession and, at the same time, due restitution be made, the sin will meet its chastisement, not in purgatory, but in hell. Alas, yes, it is especially in the other life that divine justice will punish the guilty usurpers of the property of the dead. Judgment without mercy to him that hath not to done mercy, says the Holy Ghost. James 2.13 if these words be true, how rigorous a judgment awaits those whose detestable avarice has left the soul of a parent, a benefactor, for months, years, perhaps even for centuries, in the frightful torments of purgatory. This crime, as we have said above, is the more grievous, because in many cases these suffrages, which the deceased asks for his souls, are but disguised restitutions. This fact is in some families but too often overlooked. People find it convenient to speak of intrigue and clerical avarice. The finest pretexts are made use of to invalidate a last will and testament, which often, perhaps in the majority of cases, involves a necessary restitution. The priest is but a medium in this indispensable act, bound to absolute secrecy by virtue of his sacramental ministry. Let us explain this more clearly. A dying man has been guilty of some injustice during his life. This is of a more frequent occurrence than we imagine, even in regards to men who are most upright in the eyes of the world. At the moment when he is about to appear before God, this sinner makes his confession. He wishes to make a full reparation, as he is bound to do so, of all the injuries which he has caused his neighbor. But he has not the time to do it himself, and is not willing to reveal the sad secret to his children. What does he do? He covers his restitution under the veil of a pious legacy. Now, if this legacy is not paid, and consequently the injustice not repaired, what will become of the soul of the deceased? Will it be detained for an infinite length of time in purgatory? We know not all the laws of divine justice but numerous apparitions serve to give some idea of them, since they all declare that they cannot be admitted into eternal beatitude so long as any part of the debt of justice remains to be cancelled. Moreover, are not these souls culpable for having deferred until their death the payment of a debt of justice which they have owed for so long of a time? And if now their heirs neglect to discharge it for them, is it not deplorable consequence of their own sin, of their own guilty delay? It is through their fault that these ill-gotten goods remain in the family, and they will not cease to cry out against them as long as the restitution be not made. Property cries out to its lawful owner, it cries out against the unjust possessor. If through the malice of their heirs restitution is never made, it is evident that the soul cannot remain in purgatory forever, but in this case 
A long delay to its entrance into heaven seems to be a fitting chastisement for an act of injustice, which the soul has retracted, it is true, but which still abides in its efficacious cause. Let us, therefore, think of these grave consequences when we allow days, weeks, months, and perhaps even years to elapse before discharging so sacred a debt. Alas, how feeble is our faith! If a domestic animal, a little dog, falls into a fire, do you delay to draw it out? And see your parents, benefactors, person most dear to you, wither in the flames of purgatory, and you do not consider it's your urgent duty to relieve them? You delay and you allow long days of suffering to pass for those poor souls without making an effort to perform those good works which to release them from their pains? Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 42 Motives of Justice We have just spoken of the obligation of justice, which is incumbent upon heirs, for the execution of pious legacies. There is another duty of strict justice, which regards children. They are obliged to pray for their deceased parents. Reciprocally, in their turn, parents are bound by natural right not to forget before God those of their children who have preceded them into eternity. Alas, there are parents who are inconsolable at the loss of a son or of a dearly beloved daughter, and who, instead of praying for them, bestow upon them nothing but a few fruitless tears. Let us hear what Thomas of Contemporary relates on the subject. The incident happened in his own family. The grandmother of Thomas had lost a son in whom she had centered her fondest hopes. Day and night she wept for him and refused all consolation. In the excess of her grief, she forgot the great duty of a Christian love and did not think of praying for that soul so dear to her. The unfortunate object of this barren tenderness languished amid the flames of purgatory, receiving no alleviation of his sufferings. Finally, God took pity on him. One day, whilst plunged in the depths of her grief, this woman had a miraculous vision. She saw on a beautiful road a procession of young men, as graceful as angels, advancing full of joy towards a magnificent city. She understood that they were souls from purgatory making their triumphal entry into heaven. She looked eagerly to see if among their ranks she could not discover her son. Alas, the child was not there, but she perceived him approaching far behind the others, sad, suffering, and fatigued, this garment drenched with water. O oh, dear object of my grief, she cried out to him, how is it that you remain behind the brilliant band? I should wish to see you at the head of your companions. Mother replied the child in a plaintive tone, it is you. It is these tears which you shed over me that moisten and soil my garments, and retard my entrance into the glory of heaven. Cease to abandon yourself to a blind and useless grief. Open your heart to more Christian sentiments. If you truly love me, relieve me in my sufferings. Apply some indulgences to me. Say prayers, give alms, obtain from me the fruits of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is by this means that you will prove your love. For by doing so, you will deliver me from prison where I languish, and bring me forth to eternal life, which is far more desirable than the life terrestrial which you had given me. Then the vision disappeared, and that mother thus admonished, and brought back to true Christian sentiments. Instead of giving way to immoderate grief, apply to the practice of every good work which could give relief to the soul of her son. The great causes of our forgetfulness, this indifference, guilty neglect, and injustice towards the dead is a lack of faith. For if we do not see that true Christians, those animated by the spirit of faith, make the most noble sacrifices on behalf of their departed friends, descending in spirit into these penal fires, there contemplating the rigors of divine justice, listening to the voice of the dead who implore their compassion, 
They think only how to give relief to the poor souls, and consider it the most sacred duty to procure for their parents and departed friends all the suffrages possible according to their means and condition. Happy are those Christians. They show their faith by their works. They are merciful, and in their turn they shall obtain mercy. Blessed Margaret of Cretona was at first a great sinner, but after she had been sincerely converted, she blotted out her past disorders by great penances and works of mercy. Her charity towards the poor souls knew no bounds. She sacrificed everything, time, repose, satisfactions to obtain the deliverance from Almighty God. Understanding that devotion towards the holy souls, when well directed, has for his first object our parents. Her father and mother being dead, she never ceased to offer for them her prayers, mortifications, vigils, sufferings, communions, and the masses at which she had the happiness to assist. In reward for her filial piety, God revealed to her that by all of her prayers she had shortened it the long term of suffering which her parents would have had to endure in purgatory that she obtained their complete deliverance and entrance into paradise. 